from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures on the double life of RNA will be presented by Dr. Thomas R. Check, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and 1989 Nobel laureate in chemistry. The fourth lecture will discuss life at the end of the chromosome, another RNA machine. And now, to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Joseph Perpich. Welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for the fourth and final holiday lecture on science. Our speaker is Dr. Thomas Check, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Check's fourth lecture feature, focuses on RNA interactions with telomeres the DNA found at the ends of chromosomes. That magical, mysterious molecule called DNA and its cousin RNA are engaged at the ends of chromosomes to guide the aging of the cell and under certain circumstances, transforming it into a cancer cell. Tom Check has called this interplay chromosome end games. Tom will tell how he and scientists in laboratories around the world are pursuing the secrets of the telomere and the enzyme telomerase. Once again, they are going boldly where none has gone before. Tom? Thank you, Joe. For this final lecture, I would like to switch a bit from uh, RNA to talking about chromosomal DNA. But as you can already tell from the hint given in the title to my talk, RNA is going to creep back into the story, although that was not clear uh, to the researchers who were first investigating questions of chromosome end replication. You can also see that I've changed sweaters again. I'm now a cell biologist. How does a cell biologist differ from a molecular biologist? Well, there are many people who consider themselves simultaneously cell biologists and molecular biologists, but if I had to give a simple definition, I would probably say that a cell biologist is more interested in questions of where molecules are located inside cells rather than simply what those molecules are and how they function. And you'll see an example of experiments in which we actually determine the location of molecules within uh, living cells later in this talk. So in the first slide, I will show you some human chromosomes, a picture that I took when I wasn't too much older than you, when I was a first-year graduate student at Berkeley. These are human chromosomes, and as you know, a chromosome is made up of the double helix of DNA. There's a continuous molecule of DNA going from one end to the other, coated with proteins which allow it to be stained on a, a light microscope uh, slide, on a glass slide. The amount of DNA in each of these individual chromosomes is about this long, several centimeters long. The total amount of DNA in the set of human chromosomes is as tall as I am, if you would tie all of those DNA molecules end to end. And that's true for every one of the billions of cells in your body. Now, you, you're all incredulous. You don't believe that. How could it be that DNA molecule uh, this large and, in fact, 46 of them could be wrapped up in something as small as a living cell. And, of course, the answer is it's a very, very skinny molecule. It's only 20 angstroms across. And so the fact that it's very long means that the packaging problem is a very intriguing one. Uh, it has to be wrapped up in a way that it can be uh, safely packaged and be divided between daughter cells during cell division, but at the same time it has to be accessible to, for example, RNA polymerase, which makes the RNA copies of the DNA, and DNA polymerase, one of the enzymes that is responsible for copying the chromosome and making two DNA molecules where there previously was only a single molecule. The, um, 
other question that might come up when you look at chromosomes is what happens here at the end? Does the DNA just stop? Or is there some specialized structure at the very tips of the chromosomes? And uh, there, feeling that the DNA might not just stop, but that there must be something very specialized there, came from some of the early uh, fruit fly molecular geneticists who noticed that um, if you fragmented chromosomes with, for example, X irradiation, and similar experiments were done by Barbara McClintock in her uh, work with corn chromosomes. And what these workers noticed was that if you fragment a chromosome randomly, those raw ends are very unstable. They will become degraded or they'll rejoin with other raw ends of broken chromosomes, perhaps giving new combinations of chromosomal material. So the natural ends of chromosomes are very stable. So they must be something other than they must be, have a different property than just a randomly broken chromosome. And that was where the concept of a telomere or a specialized structure at the end of the chromosome uh, was first devised. What are some of the functions of these telomeres? Well, as I've already suggested, they act as a cap to cap off and stabilize the end of the chromosome, preventing it from undergoing unwanted rearrangements. They allow complete replication of the very end of the chromosome, something that DNA polymerase, which copies or reproduces the middle part of the chromosome, is unable to do. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. There's much indirect evidence that they help locate chromosomes within nuclei and provide a higher level of, of organization of the genetic material within the nucleus, although that's an area that uh, still isn't really well understood at the molecular level, the exact molecules that the telomere plugs into to give this nuclear localization, which is why I add the question mark after it. And there's also growing interest in the possibility that telomeres are checkpoints for cell division. This may have uh, implications for aging, for why cells only go through a certain number of divisions before they reach a state of senescence. And it may also have implications for cancer, which is the unwanted activation of cellular growth in cells that aren't supposed to be rapidly dividing. It's been found by quite a number of workers that uh, telomerase, an enzyme responsible for replicating the chromosome ends, is uh, not present in mature, non-dividing human cells. But then when a cell becomes cancerous, the tumors have typically, though perhaps not in every case, telomerase reactivated. And so this leads to the possibility that this chromosome end replicating molecule might be sort of an Achilles heel for diverse sorts of cancer, that if you could stop the reactivation of the machinery that copies the chromosome end, perhaps this would prevent the unwanted proliferation of cells in the, in the cancerous state. And there's much activity uh, going on both in academic laboratories and in biotechnology to try to investigate uh, this concept that perhaps telomerase is causally related to uh, activation of cellular growth and perhaps inhibition of telomerase would reverse that unwanted state. Now, what is the DNA like at the very ends of the chromosomes? And uh, interestingly, we come back to our old friend Tetrahymena, in this case, not from experiments done in my laboratory, but those done in Elizabeth, by Elizabeth Blackburn when she was a postdoctoral fellow in Joe Gall's laboratory at Yale University, where she determined the first sequence of a chromosome end from Tetrahymena. And it turned out that the sequence was a very simple sequence, six nucleotides, TT and then four Gs, repeated, what the end stands for is a large and somewhat heterogeneous number of times. So there'd be a sequence T2, G4, followed by T2, G4, T2, G4, T2, G4. And then, of course, the other strand would have the complementary 
basis. So the other strand would be a series of C's and A's. The, uh, at the very end of the chromosome, the strand that's rich in G's protrudes off the end without the C's and A's to pair with it as a short single-stranded overhang, and I'll show you a picture of that later. Human telomeres have a very similar hexanucleotide repeat, differing in only one of the six positions. And this provides us with some confidence that uh, there must be similarities with the way that chromosome ends are handled in very diverse organisms. So maybe we don't, if we're interested in human chromosome ends, maybe we don't have to study only human chromosome termini, maybe we can understand, maybe we can study simpler model systems that have uh, a similar telomeric DNA repeated sequence and therefore perhaps handle the questions of how do you cap off a chromosome end and how do you replicate it in a similar manner. One of the organisms we look at, Oxytrica, and also its closely re uh, related cousin Euplodes ediculatus, which you saw uh, in the hall at, here at the Institute on that television monitor, the one that was eating the algae, those organisms have uh, an octonucleotide repeat. Again, T's and G's, uh, in this case repeated a specific number of times rather than a large and, and heterogeneous number of times at least at the ends of the macronuclear chromosome. So this is the multiple uh, small chromosomes present in the macronucleus of, of this organism. Uh, and if you go to other organisms such as baker's yeast, you find that occasionally there's, uh, the repeat isn't quite so uniform that uh, instead of being a very accurate repeated sequence, in baker's yeast sometimes you find T, G, sometimes you find T followed by two or three Gs, and such blocks of sequence are repeated large number of times. So far, it's only in the fruit, fr fruit fly, Drosophila, that, a, uh, fail that it looks like chromosome ends are maintained without there being a simple repeated sequence. So we have uh, a phenomenon here that's extremely widespread in biology for organisms that have linear chromosomes, which would be the eukaryotic organisms. Bacteria don't have to worry about telomeres. They have circular chromosomes. If you have a circle, that's a, not, a nice way of not having to worry about ends, right? But those organisms that have linear chromosomes with ends typically have this sort of repeated sequence at the end. So given this similarity, we chose an organism to look at. Uh, this is Oxytrica, that has a large number of chromosomes and therefore a large number of ends. There are 46 chromosomes in a human cell, in a diploid cell. There are about 46 million chromosomes in each oxytrica cell. So we have a million-fold <coughs> abundance of telomeres and of all of the goodies that interact with telomeres. And if you're a biochemist and you want to uh, under, you want to purify and understand the function of a molecule, why not pick an organism that exaggerates a particular phenomenon so that you have a lot more material to work with? The uh, advantage of choosing this organism becomes very apparent when uh, you simply take, isolate the large nuclei from these cells and extract the protein present in those nuclei. You find in this lane, this again is a gel electrophoresis technique used to separate, in this case, protein molecules rather than RNA molecules uh, according to their molecular weight. So the small ones are near the bottom and the large ones near the top. These numbers refer to uh, thousands of Daltons or thousands of mass units. So this would be 18,000. Uh, as you can see, biochemists work with very large molecules compared to the sort that you encounter in a uh, normal chemistry course. So we have uh, present in these nuclei the histone proteins which wrap up the middle parts of the chromosomes and form what are called nucleosomes in oxytrica just as they would in human. And then we see two prominent proteins at about uh, 43 and 56,000 molecular weight, and those turn out to form this chromosome cap. 
in a single step purification, uh, taking advantage of their tight association with the chromosome ends, we can purify, you can see, essentially to completeness these telomere proteins and then ask the question, uh, why do there have to be two of them and exactly what do they do to help maintain the end of the chromosome? The story that we worked out was that it's the very end of the chromosome, the place where the double-stranded repeated sequence ends and the G-rich strand protrudes for 16 nucleotides beyond the double-stranded region of the chromosome. This single-stranded overhang is the place that the alpha and beta subunits of the, we call the big one alpha and the sm slightly smaller one beta, these two subunits of the telomere protein recognize this sequence and form a very tight complex on the, both ends of each of these multiple chromosomes. So this provides a way of preventing degradation and other unwanted associations of chromosome ends by uh, sealing off the DNA with this very tightly bound protein complex. We've gone a step further and we've taken apart each of those protein chains and asked the question, well, can, can we define a different activity for different parts? of each of these polypeptides. Remember, a protein is just a string of amino acids that are chemically bonded to each other. And so uh, using genetic engineering, we can uh, use the bacterium E. coli to grow either the normal type of oxytrica telomere binding protein, or we can make variant proteins, which are missing a portion of the polypeptide <coughs> chain. When we did this analysis on the alpha chain, we found that uh, a portion of the protein near the left-hand end was sufficient for binding to the DNA, but it bound much more weakly than the entire complex. The reason it bound so weakly uh, had to do with the fact that beta was not also present in the complex. So the left-hand part of alpha by itself can bind to chromosome ends, but then if you add beta, nothing happens. The beta just ignores it and does not enter into the complex. The right-hand portion of the alpha chain is needed in order to recruit beta into this complex. And then the portion of beta that is involved in helping make the chromosome cap is just its left-hand portion, amino acids in between position 5 and 232. The right-hand portion of beta is not directly involved in capping off the chromosome, but it's an arm that reaches out and appears to interact, make one chromosome end interact with the DNA from other chromosome ends. A fascinating story by itself, which I'm not going to have time to explore in much detail during this hour. A colleague of mine, uh, Steve Schultz, working completely independently from our lab, uh, he's an X-ray crystallographer, and he decided to take on the huge challenge of trying to get one of these X-ray crystallographic, let's see where every atom is located, sort of views of the complex between alpha, beta, and the DNA that caps off the chromosome end. And before I show you that picture, I want to show you the picture that a graduate student in the laboratory, Guo Wei Fang, was able to derive from biochemical experiments without using crystallography. And it was based on the domain analysis that I just showed you. Uh, in his PhD thesis, he suggested that both the alpha and the beta subunits must be interacting with the DNA, that uh, the alpha subunit must have one domain that interacts directly with the DNA, and then another domain which is making very strong interactions with the beta subunit in order to hold uh, the, in order to recruit beta subunit into the complex. And then that other portion of the beta chain, which I didn't tell you before, is very positively 
charged, contains very positively charged uh, or basic amino acids, is sticking out uh, as an arm to interact with other chromosomal ends. So this was the amount of detail we could get from our biochemical studies. And now growing crystals of this complex, the Schultz lab has been able to see what it really looks like. And of course, the reason I show you this picture is that it really looks fairly similar to what we were able to infer from the more indirect biochemical studies. The alpha subunit is the whitish uh, portion uh, on the top and the green portion, and you can see that there are two separate domains. The whitish portion interacts with the DNA. Let me take you through the DNA. In this particular crystal complex, there's a 12 nucleotide uh, artificial telomere. The first four guanine residues are shown in blue. The next four residues are the T's, and they're shown in yellow. And then the last four are G's again, and they're shown in um, as, as red units, and I think you can see them there, 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 and there. The uh, beta subunit also interacts with this telomeric DNA. So you can see the DNA is uh, coming down sort of in a cleft between the alpha and the beta subunits, making contacts with both polypeptides, and that the other domain of the alpha subunit doesn't directly interact with the DNA, but helps, make, but helps bring the beta subunit into the complex by having a very large surface of interaction and, uh, with, the, with the beta subunit to stabilize it entering into the complex. The alpha subunit alone binds pretty tightly to DNA, moderately tightly. It dissociates on the level, on, on the order of uh, once every minute or so, and then of course it can rebind. Once beta is recruited into the complex, the complex is stable for days. It is, according to the literature search we've done, it's the tightest, strongest nucleic acid protein complex we've been able to find uh, evidence for. And so the presence of beta ch converts this from a moderately stable uh, association to a rock that is very hard to, to pry off, leading to the interesting question, uh, when you copy the chromosome, maybe you have to dislodge this complex. There must be machinery there to interrupt this association between the protein and the nucleic acid. Now, let's move from the question of the capping off of the chromosome end. So, so far, I, RNA hasn't come into this picture at all. I hope you realize, finally, he isn't talking about RNA. It's just very simple, DNA, protein. But hold on, hold on to your seats, you're going to uh, see RNA in a minute here. So we now have to talk about the replication or the copying of the uh, chromosome. And the interior parts of the chromosome in higher organisms are copied in a way uh, rather similar to that first worked out by Arthur Kornberg and others for uh, replication of bacterial chromosomes. The DNA, the, our, the DNA chain has a polarity. It has a five prime end and a, and a three prime end. So there's a directionality to this string of nucleotides. And the D enzyme DNA polymerase only goes in one direction on the DNA. So it has a polarity too. It goes in the uh, opposite direction of the DNA chain. So if the DNA chain, the top one is shown going from 3 prime to 5 prime, so the DNA polymerase goes 5 prime to 3 prime, and can, in this direction, can continuously make a copy of the double helix out to the very end. Same thing here. In this continuous or leading strand direction, you can copy all the way out to the end. But then, in this position, because it can only uh, go in that one direction, before this bubble has been opened up all the way, it, there's only a little part available to be copied. So it makes a small discontinuous fragment, starting with an RNA primer. So there's a little piece of RNA that is put down on the DNA as a starting point, and then the DNA polymerase extends that. And it makes this extension, another one, another one, in each case then removing the little piece of RNA that started it out and filling in with DNA. And that can proceed all the way out to the end. Now, the 
dilemma about DNA replication at the end is that at the left end, so I'm only showing the daughter molecule that would be produced by the top strand. The um, copy of the top strand uh, would not have a problem at the very end because this uh, blue RNA primer can be removed and now you're back to having the three prime end of the chromosome hanging out which is the natural state. So that is complete replication then. The problem perhaps occurs instead at the other end of the chromosome, where complete replication will leave you with a uh, blunt end to the chromosome, no three prime overhang. And you can take my word for it or you can draw it out for yourself that the problem is exactly identical on the bottom strand. If you simply flip it around, you see that again at one end, the end where discontinuous replication takes place, you can uh, copy the end faithfully. At the other end, you lose some material. And scientists have seen this chromosome loss. If there's a defect in the machinery that overcomes this problem, the chromosome actually shrinks from its end. And as it shrinks, eventually you'll get into a place where there are important genes which are being lost. And so it's to prevent this sort of chromosome shrinkage that some special machinery is required. The machinery was discovered by Elizabeth Blackburn and her graduate student Carol Greider working at the University of California at Berkeley. And they found that the uh, machine responsible for solving this end replication problem was an unusual enzyme composed of both protein components, you can see this yellow and orange segment, but also an RNA molecule shown in purple. So this is a ribonucleoprotein enzyme that contains essential RNA and essential protein components. What do they each provide? Well, we know something of what they provide. The RNA strand has a region on it that is the complement of the sequence that has to be laid out at the end of the chromosome. So here's the chromosomal DNA, here's its single strand extension. Uh, building blocks are being added and polymerized onto the end. How does it know that it's supposed to have the sequence TT, GG, GG? Well, because the RNA template has the complementary sequence, and wherever there's an A in the template, a T is put down. Wherever there's a C in the template, a G is put down after it. If this were the human telomerase, the telomerase has been uh, isolated over the, the past year, and it's found, remember the telomere sequence differs in one out of the four positions. There's an A here, and so across from that A on the RNA strand, there's a U then, and otherwise the template sequence is very similar to, to what I've shown here. This is the, the tetrahymena version here. So the RNA provides a template and may provide other functions as well. The protein uh, presumably provides the catalytic machinery for bringing in the nucleotides and polymerizing them. So this is not a ribozyme. The RNA isn't able to do this by themselves. There's this uh, close cooperation between RNA and, and protein components. So how does this telomerase uh, solve this end replication problem? Well, in a word, Remember, the problem was down here that we have a blunt end chromosome. If telomerase can now simply extend this back out uh, to give this three prime extension, this overhang of the chromosome, now you're back to having exactly the ends that you had at the beginning. And so by removing the primer from the left end and by extending the right end with this novel RNA protein enzyme, the replication problem is solved. We decided to try to extend the number of different telomerases that were known because often comparison between telomerases from or between any biochemical component from one species to another can be very informative about uh, the function of various portions of the molecule. This turned out to be a very difficult procedure because the telomerase RNA subunit has a completely different sequence when you go from 
organism to organism, or almost completely different. The only portion of it that we could count on having a particular sequence was the template region. So, so the um, tetrahymena telomerase had been found by Blackburn and Greider. We're trying to find the telomerase RNA from Oxytrica or from, and from uh, Euplodes, and the one portion that we could count on was that it would have uh, a template region within the gene encoding for the telomerase RNA that would have C's and A's because they would have to template the addition of the G4T4 strand at the end of the chromosome. So we, were, we thought that that was a, a very reasonable expectation. There was no other part of the telomerase RNA itself that we felt that we could predict the sequence of. However, right to the left or upstream of the start of the gene, there has to be some kind of a block of nucleotides in the DNA that tell RNA polymerase to sit down there and make RNA in the direction shown by the arrow. That's called a promoter sequence. And based on the sequences of other pr promoters in ciliated protozoa, we're able to make a guess as to what that promoter sequence would be. We then used a very powerful technology that's only uh, been available for the last few years called the polymerase chain reaction. And it enables one in a, a test tube outside of a living organism to go from one copy of a nucleic acid to two, to four, to eight, to 16. And before long, you have a whole test tube crowded with molecules that were all copied from one original molecule, even if that original molecule was a single gene in a mixture of uh, many thousands or hundred thousand other genes. How does this work? Well, just to describe it briefly, you make a short synthetic piece of DNA by chemical synthesis that can pair with the yellow region. And then you add an enzyme that extends that, you, you pair that short synthetic piece with one strand of the gene and you extend it in the direction to the left. Now you make another uh, synthetic DNA that can pair with, the, uh, with that strand that you've just made uh, using the information about the promoter sequence. And then you extend that to the right and it goes back and forth extending to the left and to the right. The information to, uh, outside to the left of the red block and to the right of the yellow block is lost and you end up making a huge number of copies of just the uh, DNA that's in between and at this point you can uh, clone in a bacterium and sequence the nucleotides along this region. Then you can go back later and find the remainder of the, of the gene. When we did this, we found that, now, this is a, a picture of the complete nucleotide sequence of the telomerase RNA from tetrahymena, as determined in the Blackburn Laboratory, and from uh, Oxytrica and Euplodes, and another set of, uh, another um, genus of ciliates called Stylonychia that uh, were determined in our laboratory. I know you can't read from where you're sitting the individual uh, A's, G's, C's, and U's that make up these sequences. But if you could see them, you'd see that there's almost no correspondence from one to the next. These have completely different RNA sequences, except that in the template region, they all have, which is uh, highlighted by this dark bar, they all have the C's and A's that are needed to specify the blocks of G's and T's at the end of the chromosome. However, the folding of the RNA is very similar in all cases. Even though the nucleotides are different, they pair with each other in a way that forms a molecule with a long handle coming out here, a helical region here, and a complex structure uh, in this portion where there's one RNA strand paired with itself, and then its loop can bend back and pair with another adjacent portion of the RNA sequence. That particular kind of structure is called a pseudonaut by people who work on 
RNA structure. It's not a real knot. It would be a real knot if you passed the RNA chain through the eye of the needle. Instead, if you just lay it down on the outside, it's called a pseudonaut. So these, this is an example of different RNA molecules that f perform the same function in different cells. They have the same structure, more or less, or at least a highly conserved structure, but they attain that structure through a very different sequence of A's, G's, and C's and U's. So that, for example, in this stem number one, where there's a GC base pair in the middle of it in tetrahymena, there may be a uh, AU base pair or a, or a flipped over CG base pair uh, in one of the other organisms. So you can make a structure using different combinations of the four building blocks. I'd like to now turn to what I promised you I would get to, uh, um, the cell biology area. Can we ask the question, where are, these uh, where are these molecules located in the cell? So I'll remind you that we have two different components that we want to, that we might be interested in localizing. One is the telomere binding protein that caps off the end of the DNA and stabilizes it. The other is this enzyme that contains RNA, telomerase, which recognizes the DNA and extends it, thereby solving the shrinking chromosome problem and achieving complete copying of the genetic material. So let's start out with the end binding protein. How would we localize a specific protein in a cell? And the answer is that uh, we can use an antibody that is specific to recognizing the protein of interest. It, you can use the protein of interest as an antigen and raise antibodies as in an experimental way, much as our bodies naturally raise antibodies against uh, antigens such as viral antigens which we encounter in our everyday life. And those antibodies shown here in red can then be very specific reagents to recognize a protein of interest uh, instead of the, all of the other diverse proteins that would be present in a cell. Well, once we've tagged the protein of interest with an antibody, that still doesn't enable a, us to see it because antibodies are very small molecules, so how are we going to find it? You can take another antibody which will recognize any rabbit antibody, and this secondary antibody is tagged chemically with a fluorescent group so that when it's excited with the right wavelength of light, it glows a particular color. So then by this indirect immunofluorescence technique, one can have this antibody recognizing the protein of interest, this tagged antibody recognizing the antibody, and indirectly light up the location of the protein of interest. We've done this with antibodies uh, directed against the alpha subunit of the telomere protein. And you can see that it uh, looks like the entire nucleus of oxytrica is filled up with that telomere binding protein. Well, that's pretty reasonable. If we've got 48 million copies of something in a nucleus, chances are it's going to have to be pretty much filling up the whole nucleus in order to crowd that many in. If we compare the distribution of the end binding protein with just the distribution of the DNA, and we do this in a very similar way, but we use an antibody tagged with a different fluorescence group so that now it glows green instead of glowing red, we see that the DNA also fills up most of the nucleus. And when we superimpose these two images, yellow tells us everywhere where the telomeres and the DNA coexist. And you can see the nucleus uh, has co-localized uh, chromosome ends and DNA, except for a number of holes which have neither DNA nor telomere protein present. I'll get back to those holes later on. If we do the same experiment with the other subunit of the end binding protein from what I've told you about it, the beta subunit is right there hanging on to the same complex as the alpha subunit. So if we've done the experiment right, it better be in the same location. 
And sure enough, beta fills up the nucleus along with the DNA and the superposition of the two. This is a different nucleus, so it's a little different shape. Uh, I call this one the eggplant. Uh, but in any case, uh, you can see that it fills up the entire nucleus, except again for a number of holes which contain neither DNA nor telomere protein. Now let's switch over to asking the question, where is the telomerase located within the cells? The telomerase is the enzyme that's going to copy the chromosome end. So we assume that it, of course, would be located in the same place. Is that the case? So what's the technique that can be used? Again, there are many different RNAs within a cell nucleus. There are messenger RNAs, transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and a very small fraction of the RNA is this telomerase RNA. We want to find the location of this RNA and not be bothered with all of the others. We can take advantage of the specificity of Watson-Crick base pairing, a theme that's come up probably 20 times already in these lectures, A recognizing uh, T or, or A recognizing U, and we can make a probe of a sequence that will be complementary to and thereby bind to the telomerase RNA and not to the other RNAs in the cell. That probe molecule can be chemically derivatized with a small molecule called biotin. The reason for doing that is that there's a protein that's quite easily obtained called avidin that has a very high affinity and binds biotin very specifically. And avidin can be chemically derivatized with a fluorescence group. So it's a, the, the details are different, but it's a very similar strategy to how do we tag a specific protein in a cell. If we want to tag a specific RNA, we um, use a biotinylated oligonucleotide, a stretch of nucleic acid sequence, to pair with the RNA of interest and in turn recognize where that is in the cell by a fluorescence tagged protein. When that experiment was done on the oxytrica nuclei, we see a pattern that is strikingly different from what I showed you before. You can see that there is fluorescence throughout the nucleus. The, by the way, for those of you watching from Texas, this particular stain is called Texas Red, which I think is a great name. Uh, you can see that there's Texas Red staining indicating uh, where the telomerase RNA is located, to some extent throughout the nucleus, but particularly in a number of globular uh, focal points. And then there's this band. It looks sort of like a belt around the nucleus. That turns out to be the site of active replication. So the replication in these nuclei starts at one end of the nucleus, moves to the other, and active replication is taking place inside of the replication band. And you can see there's quite a bright staining for telomerase RNA at that point. So now let's look at where the telomerase is located relative to the telomeres. And as I said before, our expectation would be that they would be in the same place. Instead, they're almost completely segregated from each other. Here's where the telomerase RNA is located. Here's where the telomeres are located, as judged by the alpha antibody or the anti-beta antibody. And when you superimpose the two images, you see that the telomerase is filling up those holes where there isn't chromosomal material. Here's another example. And only in the case of a replicating nucleus, where we have a replication band, do we see telomerase in the replication band, we see DNA and telomeres in the replication band, and we see a nice yellow stripe at one edge of the replication band. So perhaps we've learned something, or at least we have enough evidence to come up with a, a reasonable hypothesis that maybe telomerase works in a concerted way, coordinated with replication of the middle parts of the chromosome. And that's why the two sorts of molecules are localized in the same place at the same time. Well, then how about all the telomerase that's localized in these uh, holes where there is not chromosomal material? Well, maybe that 
is a site of assembly of the telomerase, where the RNA is assembled with the protein subunits to form the active enzyme, or perhaps it's a site of storage or transport or maturation of this telomerase ribonucleoprotein enzyme. Uh, you may think it's strange that the nucleus devotes so much of its space to just storing telomerase, but and, and we thought it was very strange, and therefore we said, well, I'll bet there are other things being sequestered in those spherical areas as well. So it turned out that other small RNA protein complexes, such as the SNRNPs, the SNRPs, which some of you have asked me about at the coffee break, which are involved in messenger RNA splicing for those introns that aren't self-splicing. They have these other RNA protein complexes that are involved in their splicing. Those are also localized in these same uh, sort of spherical bodies as the telomerase. So these are not, if these are storage or maturation depots within the nucleus, they're not working only with telomerase, but with a number of small particles that have to have RNA and protein uh, organized in a very cooperative way. So in summary, we find that the, uh, this protein that caps off the end of the chromosome co-localizes with the DNA that much to our surprise initially, most of the telomerase doesn't co-localize with the telomeres, but instead is found in these spheres that also contain these uh, SNRPs, and they may be assembly or storage centers, although that's a speculation that remains to be tested. Finally, we find that uh, telomerase does co-localize with the telomeres at the site of active replication. And to the extent that two things being together implicates their acting in a co coordinated way, which again has to be tested, uh, we can at this point only say that we can suggest, rather than that we've really proven, that uh, the replication of the chromosome end is perhaps coordinated with the replication of the middle parts of the chromosome. So I've taken you uh, in this last hour through a uh, sequence of events that have allowed us to look a little bit more about how a portion of the cell is organized, how the nucleus is organized with its chromatin, which is the DNA, chromosomal DNA, rather dispersed through the nucleus, uh, but there is some substructure in the nucleus and that some of that substructure is involved in uh, handling the enzyme which is responsible for replication of the end of the chromosome. I've also uh, told you something about DNA protein interactions and how those DNA protein interactions can protect the chromosome ends from undergoing unwanted uh, degradation or recombination reactions and thereby stabilize these linear pieces of DNA. We imagine, but um, as yet have no direct evidence, that the very ends <coughs> of human chromosomes are perhaps also stabilized by a specific protein, although that protein has not yet been found. Obviously, that's a much tougher problem because there are many fewer chromosomes and many fewer ends, and so that's going to be a very rare protein, whereas in Oxytrica, it was a rather abundant protein. And finally, I would like to assure you that I did not do all of this work myself or I'm sure you've already guessed that. I've tried to, uh, and I'm sure I've been rather incomplete about giving proper credit to my coworkers, but I've tried, when I could remember it, to mention my own coworkers and laboratories throughout the world that we stay in close touch with uh, to try to learn from each other's findings. So I wanted to show you, um, this is telomerase again, but what I really wanted to show you was uh, a picture from a, of my research group from a recent group party, just to give you a feeling of the number of people involved. They, some of them are undergraduate students, which you will be next year, uh, who are doing undergraduate research, uh, either for credit or over the summer. Some of them have been supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for summer research. 
Some of them are graduate students who are getting PhD degrees, and some of them are postdoctoral fellows who've already gotten their PhD at another institution and then have come to Colorado for a period of perhaps three years to do additional studies before getting a permanent job on their own. And they come from many different places. They come from Kansas and from Colorado. They come from uh, Baltimore nearby here, and they come from uh, Zurich, Switzerland. They come from Chicago, and they come from Japan and China and uh, everywhere that you could imagine. And then part of the educational process is that we then send them off to uh, different places after they've had some training. And some of the people uh, shown in this particular slide, uh, for example, this woman is now on the faculty at Yale University. Uh, this fellow is on the faculty at Duke University. And so they um, come spend some time with us and then go off and do wonderful things on their own. And it's really their hard work which uh, has been the basis for uh, me being able to present these stories to you over the last two days. Thank you. Questions? And we have time for some questions. in the red sweater back there. Yeah, um, I want to know, um, do you have any idea how you would go about testing for what those uh, telomerases that fill the holes, what they're used for, whether it's maturity or storage or whatever? Do you have any idea how you would test for that? So the, so the question is, how would we proceed to ask to try to understand whether these holes are uh, storage uh, depots for telomerase or are involved in maturation or, or to answer this question instead of just speculating about it. And uh, there are really quite a number of possible approaches. What we need is some way to look at the dynamics of, of the operation. What we have right here is a static picture. And what instead we'd like to know is, is the movement in and out. Because if they are storage uh, depots, then there must be a time when molecules are moving in. If those spherical regions are involved in maturation of the particle, then the material moving in and that moving out should be different. It should be matured. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that the RNA moves in there separate from the proteins and that they get together and form telomerase inside of the spheres, and then the stuff that comes out is mature telomerase. So, one thing that we need to do is to have uh, molecular probes to identify the protein subunits of the telomerase as well as the RNA. We'd also, there are ways of pulse labeling molecules so that you can actually follow their movement through a cell. And that could be used to look at the pathway of the molecules into and out of these organelles, either by biochemistry or by this. Um, sort of cell biolo biology, uh, physical localization. Um, it may be that the RNA is made as a longer precursor and has to be trimmed down to its final active form. Most RNAs in cells do undergo some sort of processing. So if we can find that molecule that isn't yet mature, the, the telomerase RNA that's not yet in its final form, we can make a probe for it and we can see where the unmature form is and where the mature form is to get some idea whether the maturation is taking place inside of those spheres or in some other location within the nucleus. So we have lots of ideas, but as of today, I have no answers for you. So as with all of these projects, I hope I've given you the feeling they're ongoing projects. Every time you answer a question in a satisfying way, you typically, it leads to two more questions which you would then like to answer. I thank you for your questions. We're going to pause now for closing and then we'll have time for more questions later. On behalf of the entire audience and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Tom, we want to thank you for a really marvelous series. And so to our television viewers, we'd like to hear from you too. Uh, tell us what you found interesting about these lectures and if there's something we can do to make them even more useful to us. 
At the end of the broadcast, you'll see our mailing address. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute is the largest philanthropy in the country, and as a medical research organization, its primary purpose is to conduct biomedical research through its own investigators like Dr. Check. There are now 280 HHMI investigators located in 62 medical schools, universities, and research institutes across the country. Uh, uh, most of them do not have the Nobel Prize like Dr. Check, but they're making enormously exciting discoveries every day. Things like finding the genes involved in muscular dystrophy, in cystic fibrosis, in high blood pressure, and mental retardation, and exploring the defects in uh, the control mechanisms themselves that lead to cancer, uh, looking at the uh, mechanisms by which AIDS and tuberculosis uh, cause disease, learning how the brain develops and how it learns and remembers. Uh, all of these things are things that we pursue on a daily basis. Uh, in the past 10 years, the Institute has invested over $2 billion in research by its own investigators. In addition to that, however, it's awarded over $450 million in grants. And these are grants intended to strengthen science education and to encourage people like you to pursue careers in science and in teaching. Uh, we want students to learn firsthand that science is not memorizing facts from a book, but it's a wonderful voyage of discovery, a, a journey in which you learn things that no one has learned before, and you've contributed a bit to our, the understanding of the world and its well-being. So on behalf of all of us here, I want to thank Dr. Check. I want to thank the television crew. I want to thank those who have labored behind the scenes here at the Institute to make these uh, lectures such a great success. So at this time of, of, of peace and understanding, we wish you a, a new year filled with wonderful happiness and great science. Thank you. <laughs>